Hi, Year 4. Hope you're all doing okay. Welcome to your lesson um, today on ancient Egypt. Your learning intention for today is to know what hieroglyphics were used for in ancient Egypt. And you have some um, objectives today, which you're going to hopefully achieve by the end of the lesson. So the first one is to be able to create a papyrus sheet. Then your second one is to spell and write words using hieroglyphics. And then to be able to to be able and explain why that doesn't make sense. Sorry, I've just read that. To be able to explain, it should be. There we go. Sorry about that. To be able to explain why the Rosetta Stone was important in our understanding of hieroglyphics. Now, a lot of that you're probably thinking, what is she talking about? But in due course, my friends, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Hopefully, anyway. So what do you think hieroglyphics were used for? These are pictures of hieroglyphics. It's obviously something to do with ancient Egypt. What do you think they were used for in ancient Egypt? So 5,000 years ago, when the ancient Egyptians were around, what do you think they were used for? I hope you've had a quick think about that or a quick chat. And they were actually used for writing. So the ancient Egypt Egyptians invented one of the earliest known writing systems. And the system itself was called hieroglyphics. Each of the symbols um, that they used for writing were called hieroglyphs, and it actually comes from a Greek word meaning sacred carving. In ancient Egypt, the people who wrote hieroglyphs were called scribes. When we looked at scribes last week in our lesson on an Egyptian family, um, we looked at how normally it was only the rich people that went, and normally only boys um, who went to school to learn how to scribe because it was quite a um, it was quite an important job which only the rich children were able to do. And it was quite hard as well because there were actually around 700 different signs and objects um, to learn, which is a lot. Think about our alphabet. We have, um, is it 26? I think it's 26. 26 letters in the alphabet. And they have 700. So think about that. It's a lot of things to learn to be able to write. So it's quite interesting. So before um, they invented the hieroglyphics, they didn't have a writing system which is, is quite weird to think because they wouldn't have had an alphabet. So they wouldn't have been able to write and communicate with each other in that way. So this is a hieroglyphic alphabet. Um, this is just from BBC Bite Size. You can see all the different symbols here. Um, you might want to revisit this later as well for the activity that we're going to do. So what problem did we have with hieroglyphics up until 200 years ago? So um, after the ancient Egyptians, people outside of Egypt found all of these um, piece of not paper it's called papyrus with hieroglyphics on and walls and carvings and all those kind of things and they didn't know what they stood for they just thought oh these are these are some nice symbols they look good but over time people realized they must mean something it's, it's some form of writing um so it was only up until 200 years ago actually when this they actually became understood for what they are. So how did that all start then? So people outside Egypt spent many years trying to figure out what the hieroglyphics meant. Many professionals devoted almost their entire lives to making an attempt at translation. So translation just means to translate it from hieroglyphs um, into English. And it wasn't until the Rosetta Stone was found that they had a way to hear the messages of the ancient Egyptians. So the Rosetta Stone is actually a really interesting um artifact and we're going to learn about it now and why it's useful in learning about the hieroglyphics so the rosetta stone was actually found by a soldier in napoleon's army in 1799 so about 300 years ago um, in a town called el rashid which means rosetta so this is a town in egypt the stone had two different languages hieroglyphic and greek and it used three different types of script but when the British defeated Napoleon, the stone became the property of the British and was taken to England. OK, so we um, we took the Rosetta Stone once we defeated Napoleon's army and um, we started looking at it and trying to translate it to find out what it meant. The stone itself is just a big piece of black granite and that was established by one of the pharaohs. Um, it includes a list of all the all of the good things that the pharaoh had done for Egypt. So the pharaoh had written it and they were writing about all the good things that he had done. However, the problem with the stone was that um, some of it wasn't there, so they only had one portion of it, and some of the other parts had been lost, so therefore that was a bit of a problem. But over time, many scholars, so many clever people, studied the stone, and once they had translated more of the writing on the stone, they used it as a basis to work out other Egyptian hieroglyphs. 
So the Rosetta Stone became the key to unlocking the door to the messages and writings found in so many areas of Egypt. So on the walls um, and on lots of like tablets and not tablets as an electronic tablet as in like a stone tablet. Um, and from that point on, everyone began understanding the hieroglyphs and realized how smart the ancient Egyptians were because they created this writing system and they used it to communicate. And it's a very technical system and it just shows how clever they were, I guess. So here it is. This is what it looks like. Um, it's quite a big stone <laughs> with a lot of writing on it. You can see here it's really small and there's a lot of it. It says the Rosetta Stone is now in the British Museum has become one of the most visited exhibits. So it is here. You can go and visit it in the British Museum, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, be interested to see if any of you have seen it or any of you have been there um, and to hear what you thought about it. So that's the Rosetta Stone. So the Rosetta Stone helped us work out what the hieroglyphics meant, basically. Now, I know I've been talking quite a lot and that's a lot of information to take in. So if you want a break, um, I suggest typing in horrible histories, hieroglyphics into YouTube and looking at the horrible history song. It's quite good and I think you'll all enjoy it. So if you want a quick break and you want to go and watch that, pause this video, type in this and see if you can find this to have a quick look at. Okay, hopefully you managed to have a quick look at that video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. So let's move on then. Back to hieroglyphics. They were different from how we write now in lots of different ways so they could be written in almost any direction from left to right so we write from left to right so they wrote like that sometimes they also wrote from right to left or from top to bottom um so the reader would figure out which way to read it by the direction of the symbols so they wrote in any direction not just left to right like we do they didn't use any punctuation so they didn't use any full stops exclamation marks anything like that and one of the goals in the writing of the hieroglyphics was that the writing would look like art and be beautiful to look at so it the whole point in using the symbols was to make sure it kind of looked nice and their writing was as beautiful as it could be so what did the ancient egyptians write on they wrote on something called papyrus quite a funny word so the ancient egyptians egyptians often wrote on tablets remember not the elect electrical ones like um they're like slabs of stone and things like that or walls but they also wrote on a type of paper called papyrus so this is made from a tall reed like plant called papyrus um, they use strips of it and then they would uh, weave it into each other and cover it with a linen cloth and it would bind together over time so it's, it's quite a technical thing if you want to read it it's all there um, but that is how they made the papyrus so what we're going to do then is make our own papyrus, all right? So what you will need to make your own papyrus, they don't have to, if you don't have the resources, don't worry too much, um, but they're quite simple things. So most of you should have them at home. So you need one sheet of A4 lined or plain paper. Now I will let you, if you don't have a spare piece, rip a page out of your book, but don't tell anyone I said that. So you can take a page from there. Um, you need some scissors. You need a glue, um, ideally, but if not, then sellotape is fine, a ruler and a pencil and a tea bag. Now that's optional. OK, and I'll tell you why later. So if you don't have a tea bag or you don't want to use a tea bag, then don't worry. You can still make your papyrus. All right. So I'm going to, through e going to go through each step with you. Um, I did it myself and I took a picture on each step. So you, were, you would be able to see what I did and how to make it. So the first step then is get your resources ready. So get your piece of paper, your pencil, glue, ruler, scissors. All right. The second step, draw horizontal lines on a vertical piece of paper. They need to be about two centimetres apart. I made mine a bit too wide. Um, so I think if they were two centimetres, it would be better. And you should be able to make more strips. OK, um, make sure you keep pausing this video because I know I'm, I'm going to be going quite fast. Um, so pause it when you need to do a step. Step three, cut your paper into strips using the lines. So using the lines you've drawn in your paper, cut it all out so you've got lots of strips of paper. Then step, that should be step four, stick four of the strips together to make a box. So put them in a box like this, um, put some on top and then some, at the, but it doesn't really matter, but whichever ones you put on top, make sure you stick them together um, just so you can make a square like this, kind of like a window frame. If you don't have glue, then just use sellotape and sellotape it around the edge. Step five, we 
need to stick two or three strips of paper in the middle equally spread apart roughly so you can see i've got my square here and then i glued just two bits on top of it across like that now if you have smaller strips you might want to do three and put them closer together um, but it's up to you i don't mind either way so you need to do that once you've done that this is the more tricky part but um I managed to do it, so you'll be able to do it. So what you have to do is start weaving in your strips of paper in the opposite direction. So you can see that, so let me get a pen so it's clearer for you. So these are already here. So they, those are those bits. These are those bits. Um, and what you need to do is start weaving in your strips along the other way. So you can see it's starting to go here. Now, when you weave, you start, because you can see here I started on the bottom, I started underneath it, then you go over and then under and then over okay that's what weaving means if you need to watch a quick video on how to weave then there's lots of tutorials on youtube um, if you're getting yourself a bit in a pickle on how to do the weaving so you just need to go over under over under and then stick it down on the other side whether it's with glue or sellotape so you continue weaving until you get to the bottom so you go over you can see here i go over and then you go under Continue even all the strips until you fill up the whole square. So keep going down until you get to the bottom. It should look a bit like this. Once you've done that, um, you might have some bits hanging off the end. Now I had to cut mine a bit short because I didn't have enough squares, uh, strips, sorry. So I glued um, the bits over. So I kind of fold them over and then glued them down or you can sellotape them down, just kind of meeting it up so it looks a bit like this or around the corner. Step nine then. If you're so if you're not using a tea bag, you're finished at this point. If you are using the tea bag to give it that um, kind of tea stained effect, then you need to get your tea bag ready with some water in a cup or something, and make sure you put some kitchen roll underneath your paper because it is a bit messy. Um, it gets quite wet, so make sure you're somewhere where it doesn't matter if it gets a bit wet, or you've got some kitchen roll or a towel underneath your piece of paper. So then what you need to do is soak the tea bag in the water. It doesn't need to be hot. It can just be cold water. That's what I use. And then um, you just dab it and smear it across your paper. Now it's going to make it quite wet, but that's fine. Um, and it might not come out that brown to start with, but that's okay because eventually over time the, the, the brown shade comes out, I found. Um, so you kind of smear it across the paper until it's all covered and then just leave it to dry. So it should look something like this. You can see mine's not actually very brown there. And I didn't cover all of it. I kind of left parts of it white as well and that's fine then i just left it to dry it took about um half an hour to dry not very long um i did put it on the radiator though and then once you've done your papyrus so that's your papyrus made you're going to write your name in hieroglyphics on it so this is mine so you can see once it dried it looked a lot better because it was it was browner and it gave it that papyrus look um and Yours will probably look better than mine because I didn't have enough strips of paper and you can see there's quite a lot of gaps in between. So hopefully if you did a few more strips, it would probably look better than mine. And I also rushed it. So um, I'm expecting a lot better from you guys. So this is my name in hieroglyphics. I also rushed that. So I'm hoping you will take a lot more time and effort of yours. Um, if you need the alphabet, it's here. Once you've done it and you've written your name in hieroglyphics on your papyrus, uh, remember to send a picture of your work to either myself or Mr Nugent. Um, we'd love to see them and then we'll put some on the website hopefully as well to see. Um, that's all I have to say. If you have any questions or any problems with anything, um, then let me know and I hope you enjoy making your papyrus.